Welcome, everyone. We're going to uh, invite you to grab something to drink and then uh, join us. I am I'm so thrilled uh, to uh, be with everyone here tonight. And Mishin uh, Yochai, why don't you come on? Come on here. I want to I want to introduce you with the ability for everyone to see you as I uh, do so. Let's give a round of applause for our uh, leads for tonight's program. For those of uh, you that don't know me, I'm Rabbi Mo Salth, one of the clergy here at Central Synagogue. Welcome. Um, we're so glad to be together. Um, if uh, you sat around the table with me and my colleagues and we talked about what can we bring to Central Synagogue that will help uh, us understand Israel. This is not just true in these times. This is true since I've been here. I would always give the same answer, and the answer is Israel's story. And uh, so much so that I don't think like they, my colleagues ask me anymore. Like, what? Should, what? Uh, in particular, we can't bring Israel story for every program. So when we talk about a special program, what what could we do? What could we recommend um, for a program? And then when people ask us, as members of the staff here, what what can we offer to recommend our clergy, like our clergy, our congregation, to to help us have a more sophisticated understanding of what's going on in Israel? I always give the same answer, and that is. Israel Story podcast, and uh, so we have the, the founders of Israel Story podcast here tonight, Mishi Harman right here, and Yochai Meital, and um, when I asked them their titles, Mishi said, I'm the host, but uh, yes, you are the host, and you are the co-founder of this extraordinary enterprise, and uh, Yochai um, also has the title of senior producer, and, and I think one of the reasons why I always say that... Um, we should recommend people to Israel stories that you have found a way throughout the years of this incredible enterprise to um, help us who love Israel and, and want to connect more with Israel, um, get, a, get into the actual experience of people's lives in, in the land of Israel um, through, through the stories of a, of a wide range of people. We will do that tonight um, with your help. and. Um, and I don't think there's any more important time since I've gotten to know you both and uh, gotten to know Israel Story to have you here at Central Synagogue. So we're in for a treat. Um, it, it may be very, um, I would say, uh, emotional today. So I'll invite you to, to be emotional if, if you need to. Uh, we clergy at the front uh, of the sanctuary see people uh, crying all the time and having all these facial expressions all the time. This, this might be one of those evenings to do that as well. So um, thank you so much for being here, and uh, we're going to begin our program. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi, for piling on the pressure like that. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Maybe just first, before we start, I just want to acknowledge, uh, I don't know if any of you have been to uh, our sort of live shows before, but um, at least I'm, I'm a little nervous because usually our usually our, when we, when we appear in front of a crowd, uh, everything is very, very scripted. We rehearse everything a million times, um, and we sort of know pretty much what's going to happen, and we just hope there aren't any technical difficulties. But this time, it's actually just a live conversation. So, so yeah. should we start? Yeah. The last time we spoke was the 7th of October at uh, 6.30. He's so in there. Pretty. It's idea of your fruit. And I jumped out of bed as well. <laughs> and then we realized there are terrorists inside walking around the kibbutz. But there is no one to come and save you. Tal Abba is on the way. For now, I will act like she is alive and captured. I said, if, if you want to kill me, would you allow me to die as a truth? And we sift through the ashes and we try to find the remains of the people there. I didn't think such a thing can happen again. I got married this Monday in the middle of war. You are not a soldier anymore. You are 50 years old. What is the matter with you? And there's no way on earth I could do this without exactly him. Not a strong partner, great partner. Him. Him partner. And he told me, take with you a sleeping bag in a tent <laughs> and just go. I texted him and, like after I was told that he was killed. From their eyes, I was a traitor. Everybody needs their like blankie. 
their teddy bear, something to make them feel safe. I'm just another grandfather looking after his grandchild while his son is off at war. Well, what do you expect? You know, you raised me to be the Zionist. These children of Hamas now will be the killer of my children. I desperately wanted to talk about sex during my eulogy for Ido. It's like a couple of kilometers from here. Like my friend has a four by four. Let's just go cut across the fields and go get him. During war, poets, they must write about love. Everyone has to choose to be optimistic because we don't have room for pessimism. So hi everyone, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Mishi Harman and this is Yochai Metal. And we're here today to talk about our work uh, in the last seven months during the war. Um, and it's a work in progress. We're still very much in the middle of uh, this series that we started called Wartime Diaries, which we are going to be talking about and playing clips from. And um, in a way, this conversation between us um, is a, uh, an opportunity for us to reflect um, and to process what these seven months have been like for us, uh, especially, and with your help as well. And we, at the end, will um, gladly welcome uh, questions. Um, and really, um, I, I, I should say that these seven months have been extremely challenging for us um, in in ways that we're going to talk about um, talk about now. But what we want to do in the next hour and a half or so is we're going to play you clips from various different episodes that we've done um, in the last seven months. I should say that Israel Story started 13 years ago, so this is a relatively new project for us within a much larger project, um, and talk about some of the processes and thoughts that we had throughout. So yeah, where, where should we start, Mishi? I mean, it's funny, like you, usually, you know, when me and Mishi talk about this a lot in stories, the starting point is very arbitrary. Like you can, it's, a, it's sort of a, an artistic decision you make where to start. Um, and it seems like with this wartime diaries, I mean, there's, there's a very clear starting point, which is like, you know, October 7th, almost all of the interviews we started by asking our guests, uh, can you take me back to your October 7th? So I guess you, that should be the starting point. You want to take me back to your October 7th, Mish? So sure. <laughs> I'll just say that most of the people that we interview push back a little bit and say, well, actually, I want to take you back to October 6th yeah. and start the story there. And I'll do the same in answering okay. your question, Yochai. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'll start on October 6th. But instead of starting on October 6th, 2023, I'm going to start on October 6, 1973. Always the same. Uh, <laughs> um, and go back 50 years uh, in time and say that on October 6, 1973, um, my beloved father, uh, David, who passed away this year, um, was 29 years old. And he was sick. Um, and as far as I know, for the first time in his life, he didn't go to shul on Yom Kippur. Um, and my mother, his uh, wife, who was an American, Ola uh, Chadasha, a new immigrant to Jerusalem, who had two little babies, my older sister Dana, who was three, and my older brother Oren, who was nine months old, went uh, to shul by herself with the kids. And when she came back um, from shul at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, as we all know, the sirens started um, uh, sounding in, in Jerusalem. And my mother, who growing up on the Upper West Side was not accustomed to these kind of things, asked my father what this was. And he said, oh, Dorothy, don't worry. It's probably, uh, it, it's nothing. It's probably just kids playing with the antenna um, on the roof or something like that. And I uh, told that story um, in a drasha that I gave in my own synagogue, Kol uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, on Yom Kippur this year. And um, on October 7th, 50 years and a day uh, after these events um, happened, um, I woke up uh, um, to sirens that were blaring. Um, and my wife, who 
in ways both similar and different to my mother as a foreign import to Jerusalem. She's an Italian Catholic journalist. Um, woke me up and said, what is this? And I looked at her and I said, oh, it's probably just kids playing on the roof with the antenna. And in fact, I was so sure that that's what it is that we got up and we immediately took the dog and our daughter out to the Mirpeset. This is a, a little video that we shot at, I don't know if you can hear, if we can raise it a little bit. I told Mishi I think this is irresponsible behavior, but I guess so we, we were so clueless as to what was going out. We just went outside and to take the dog out. Um, and going back to October 6, um, 1973, that evening, my father, um, though he was, as I said, sick, was called up to the war and spent the next six months fighting in Ramat Golan, uh, in the Golan Heights, during which time he didn't uh, shave. And uh, when he returned back home uh, six months later, he had a very large and impressive uh, black beard, which my mother detested. But he, I think, liked it enough. So he decided to cloak it in some ideology. And he said to her that he was going to, uh, to take it off when we signed a peace agreement with one of the countries that we had been in war with. And four years later, when Sadat came to Jerusalem and addressed the Knesset, my father shaved off his beard. And unlike my father, who was 29, as I said, um, I'm 40 and have finished my reserve duty and found myself um, on October 7th, like many, many other people, um, trying to figure out what we were supposed to do. And we really didn't know. Um, and in many ways, what we've done for the uh, seven months um, since then has been my way of coping and understanding Israeli reality. Um, so we're going to get into that in a second, but before that I'll ask you, Yochai, about, about your October 7th. I, honestly, I was kind of hoping you wouldn't, but <laughs> no, so I mean, I think I, I actually live here in New York, in the Upper West Side, not far from here. Um, and I woke up early on Saturday morning to the news and was, was just glued to the news and WhatsApping with all my friends, etc., like like everybody, I guess. Um, but looking back at it now, I think, you know, you can kind of characterize Israeli society and split it up into really two groups in terms of their, re like, initial reaction on October 7th. And one half, which I think is often talked about, um, are, are people like Mishi and other people who really, like, just sprang to action, you know? either because they were called for reserve duty or else just they, they called themselves up to make uh, sandwiches or, or uh, you know, sh do shipments and, and a, million, a million things, and we'll, we'll go over some of them uh, later on in our conversation. And the other half, uh, which I think is less talked about, but I feel like I belong to, um, was basically, basically sort of in shock and paralysis, really. So I, I think I spent maybe like two or three days basically in bed, in the sofa, scrolling through the news. Uh, sometimes I would put sad Israeli songs and just, you know, lay, lay down and cry. And, and that was kind of my, I'm not like so proud of it, but honestly, my initial reaction was like paralysis and a lot of guilt over that paralysis. And, uh, and of course, hours and hours on the phone with, with you, Mishi, trying to figure out what we were going to do with, with Israel's story and what, what our reaction would do, because it wasn't really clear to us. So yeah. we found ourselves in a real problem mm -hmm. um, because we... Um, our show is called Israel's Story. Um, we're the largest Jewish and Israeli podcast in the world and have this platform which reaches tens and hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and yet we had no idea 
how to approach this moment. Um, no one had any idea how to approach this moment, of course. But, um, you know, we, we, it was an extreme, it was an extremely challenging moment because not only were we not, we were very ill-suited for this moment. Uh, as I said, we've been doing this for 13 years and we've developed a style of uh, work and a process. We work on these very, very highly produced stories that take us months and sometimes even years to report on. We go back to the same characters again and again and again and our stories have dozens and dozens of drafts and original music and so on and so forth. And here, um, obviously that wasn't relevant and not, it was so it was so irrelevant that because um, the story was changing so quickly. I mean, every time you refreshed your your phone, the story had had shifted. So we thought to ourselves, how how can we capture this moment? And we're not you know the New York Times and we're not the BBC. We can't be running after the news. We don't have that kind of manpower, those kind of resources. Um, and it was unclear to us. On the other hand, it seemed to me to be an impossibility to say, okay, well, we're going to sit this out, right? I mean, here is arguably the most dramatic moment in Israeli history, mm -hmm. at least in Israeli history in, in, in our lives. And, um, you know, as I said, we're called Israel Story, so I didn't feel that we could not relate to the moment, but we really didn't know what to do. Yeah. There's also a third factor here, which is, I think, our staff. Um, where you know they, they, we we pretty strongly felt like they, we, it was coming from them that they they didn't want to just sit around they wanted to do something um, so yeah so we, we mm -hmm. so basically on on the Monday um, right I I brought all of our producers into the office and we had a long meeting to talk about how we were going to approach this moment. And we came up with all kinds of ideas. Were we going to go in some sort of deep dive and in investigative reporting about the intelligence failure and how this happened? Were we going to send people, embed people with troops? What, uh, and at the end, what we decided to do was to try to capture as quickly as we could voices around that we were hearing around us and the different experiences of war. So. Um, in that very, very first week, we um, started what we called um, Wartime Diaries. And this is how we started our very, very first Wartime Diary. Hey, listeners, it's Mishi. So obviously, everything here has changed since Saturday, when the horrific murderous attacks by Hamas began. The members of our team are safe, uh, thank God. But all around us, friends, family, colleagues, people have died, people are missing, people have been kidnapped. The extent of it all is just shocking, and there's still a lot of uncertainty, of course. Like basically everyone else here, we're all involved in a million different initiatives, organizing housing, clothes, food, blood drives, preparing shelters. But in all of this, we're also going together with some of Israel's other leading podcasters to bring you some voices and testimonies that paint a picture or try to paint a picture of these devastating times. The voices you'll hear are raw, but we're collecting them and releasing them as fast as we can because we think it's crucial and central to our mission that you be able to hear what we're hearing now. This morning, Sasha Ariev came into our studio. Here she is. So we're here uh, with Sasha. Sasha Ariev. Um, hi, Sasha. Hi. Can hi, you guys. tell me a little bit uh, about yourself? Uh, yes. Uh, so my name is Sasha. I'm uh, 24 years old. Uh, born and raised in Israel, and um, I have a little sister. Uh, this is me. This is how I want to present myself. Um, you know, like, like listening, listening to that now, what strikes me is actually like I don't know if you guys caught this, but like the tone in which you asked Sasha that first question, just introduce yourself, such a standard question, and you almost like whisper it into the mic, and like I can almost hear you sort of tiptoeing around her um, and, it, and it reminds me like I think still now but especially in the beginning these were like we have we've we've been doing this for a long time and we've interviewed a lot of people about really hard stories but these were new situations for us to interview a, a, somebody whose sister is now held in Gaza and she just found about it a few days ago and 
how do you how do you how do you act in a responsible, sensitive, compassionate way around that? It was like almost like it was very scary, and I, I can almost like hear the the scare in your voice of like how do I what do I even do here? I, I you're right. I didn't yeah. know what to, I'm. Mean, so Sasha's little sister Karina Ariev um, was kidnapped and is still in Gaza, 216 days later. She's a soldier, right? Yeah. And she came in, and we just released that. Um, she had been kidnapped three days before. Um, and in all of these early interviews, the most um, palpable feeling was that people were just processing out loud. So um, that same first week, we talked to um, a 50-year-old man who um, had been um, discharged from reserve duty for 10 years already, but just enlisted himself on October 7th and went into the kibbutzim um, around Gaza. And we talked to him that very same week, so it was maybe two days after after that, and this is this is what he said. I saw a, a body with no head of a young, uh, young lady. I saw a, a body of a child burn. His parents tied. Uh, horrible things. I actually uh, still trying to process what I've, what I've been through. I mean, everything about the trauma was so fresh and, and, and real. They were experiencing it as they were talking about it. We talked to a father uh, who had gotten into his car um, on October 7th and drove to um, save his child who was, unbeknownst to him, partying at the Nova Festival. Um, and this is what he told us. I find myself crying 50 times a day. I think to, today maybe it was 45, so I'm getting better. And this was all just completely, completely real. and. Our sense was that we were talking to people who, like us, were traumatized but not paralyzed. Um, we talked in that first week to a woman whose husband had been called up for reserves, and she was left at home um, with four kids. There were no, no schools or kindergartens. And she was trying to explain how she explains the situation to her four kids who were like, you know, 11 nine, seven, and three, or something like that, and each one needed an explanation at a different, at a different level uh, of a reality and a story that she wasn't even able to really fully explain to herself. Um, and um, I, I think that actually um, David Broza, the, the singer, um, we did a, an episode with him early on in that f first or second week because uh, he was traveling around the country and performing in front of groups of uh, soldiers and evacuees and so on and so forth. And he, he sort of, I think, captured what was the general sentiment uh, in, in the following way. It's trauma right now. It's nobody's talking. So in a month or two, it's going to erupt. And then we're going to have, wow, thousands of people totally dysfunctional. Yeah. It's coming. But, but that was, this is still to come, because b back then it was like really early days. So we, um, of course, we just sent our reporters all over, north and south. Um, and we knew that nothing would be um, comprehensive, that we could only capture glimpses. Um, but in our first, one of our first wartime diaries, um, literally the ground was, you could like tell that it was still smoldering. Um, Michi, maybe you can play this, the clip of uh, Mitch, Mitch Ginsburg um, at the dairy farm uh, of uh, Kibbutz Kisufim. Mitch went down there and he interviewed a group of, uh, we were talking about amazing volunteers, so this is, uh, uh, he was there talking to a volunteer from Kibbutz Nahlal, who is a dairy farmer from the north, and he came down south to volunteer help, to help take care of the, uh, these dairy cows. Um, and everybody, every single person who worked in this uh, specific dairy farm in Kibbutz Kisufim was murdered. Okay, we're here in Kibbutz Kisufim, alongside the bombed out dairy shed. Uh, outside the fence, just a few yards from us, are a few motorcycles that were used by the Hamas 
uh, terrorists who arrived here. I saw before there were even like grenades on the ground here, some Kalachnikov magazines. Oh man. Yeah, I think later they even found a notebook that belonged to one of the people who were murdered and uh, gave it to whoever needed to give it. Um, this this tape and that all when Mitch was recording this, there were still bodies on the yeah, ground. Yeah, there were bodies there on the ground, and um, and 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 this next clip that um, I want Mitch to play for you is from our reporter Adina Karpuch um, on a tour of Kibbutz Be'eri, um, and this is an episode that she did with actually with, with her cousin who was a survivor and a kibbutz member from from Be'eri. An oven just like tossed on the side of the yard. Completely burned. Pillow, somebody's pillow. Um, there's a washing machine and what seems to be like a chemkia. You can still tell that it was paradise. We're walking along what seems to be tank treads that cut through the grass. This is the house of friends of mine, uh, good friends of us. And now we are in a neighborhood that's been completely destroyed. Everything is in shambles and burnt. And the Shikmim neighborhood? I don't know. I'm trying to think who survived, but so many died over there. So many murders, murders, and not died. Someone used to have a really nice swing. It's now completely burnt. There's two soccer balls. Someone's two kilo workout dumbbell. Remnants of a life. I, I live in the center of the kibbutz. And my, my house, the enter of my house is a bit hidden. And you can see my neighbor still has his uh, sukkah. And you know what? You can come back and pass over. And I guess the sukkah to still be here because we won't be here. We still are in the 7th of October. Yeah, so We're still there. I mean, but let's go to my house. That was just a tour sort of before, but I think, you know, you can't see the pictures here. So, I mean, I think, I think you all have seen these kind of pictures, but there's something that comes out from this audio, and I wanted to um, play this to illustrate how, I think you can hear it in Adina's voice, how personal all of this really is and how close it was to all of us. So it's not like reporting on something that's far from you. It's like her cousin. These are all our friends. And of course, we're not special in any way. I think it's true of basically every Israeli. Uh, and to sort of illustrate this point, so we, we sent our uh, in-house videographer, Alik Fromchenko, um, to uh, um, film a few clips that we'll show you throughout this talk. Um, asking sort of the same question to just random Israelis in uh, Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv um, and just to see what comes up. This so, is last week. Yeah, this was just from right now. שלושה ימים של חיפושים אחריו, עד שכוחות הצלה מצאו אותו. אני מיכאל לוי, אח של אור לוי. מגיע לכאן בכל הזדמנות שיש לי לכיכר החטופים, כדי לקבל קצת תמיכה ואהבה מהאנשים שמגיעים לכאן בכל, בכל יום. בעשירי בדצמבר, בנר שלישי של חנוכה, חתן שלנו נהרג. המלחמה הזאת בשבילנו זה מהפך בחיים. אני הרגשתי כל כך מחובק בתקופה הזאת של ארבעה חודשים במילואים. אני לא הרגשתי ש... אני הרגשתי שהפכנו למשפחה אחת, כאילו. 
אני, הרגע הכי זכור לי זה הרגע שנפל טיל ממש ליד הבית. ואני הייתי במקלט, מקלט ביתי, פרטי בבית, והדלת של המקלט... Uh, I and other people uh, put in a lot of work, a lot of Israelis put in a lot of work packing uh, boxes of food for people in the West Bank, and I think that has, seeing Israelis caring for Palestinians in the West Bank is something that feels important to me. Singing Maus Tzor by the, by the menorah candles on Hanukkah, and the, the last verse of asking Hashem to, to destroy our enemies and take us out of the darkness never felt so real. I think, Yochai, what we want, the reason we wanted to bring this uh, little uh, video clip was just to illustrate how um, personal the, the impact is on everyone. I mean, this is just a random sample of people that, went, that, are, that were standing outside our office um, and, 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 I don't know, half of them had a family member who had, been, who had been killed. And in those early days of wartime diaries, um, really we were engaged in a documentation project. Um, there was very little reflection. People were just telling us about sort of their immediate uh, experiences and what was going on. And we also were trying to understand how life was continuing. I mean, we talked to a, a woman who got married that week of, uh, of, uh, of the war. Her wedding was planned for, I can't remember, the Tuesday or the Wednesday or something, and she got married. This is her. So suddenly, we're all in the bomb shelter, and my friend is like tapping <laughs> my face, fixing up my makeup in the bomb shelter. And for me, that was one of the most surreal moments. And one of the things that we really focused on in those early days was documenting the countless um, volunteer efforts, chefs, uh, Yochai, and programmers, and rabbis, and farmers, and artists, and authors, and poets, and musicians, and social entrepreneurs, and archaeologists, and therapists, and educators. And um, we, you know, a lot has been said about sort of the way that civil society rose to the occasion uh, in the early days after the beginning of the war. And we were very much interested in telling, uh, telling that story. Hi, can I ask you what you're doing? I'm preparing vegetables for sandwiches. We finished the onions, and now we're on the tomatoes. But how much? Ten. And what are you and one of the things that we understood, um, both because this was our experience and we were hearing this again and again, how this volunteerism was really um, serving two purposes. Um, this is a chef in Jerusalem called Hidaya Faim who uh, sort of captured those, uh, that dual purpose uh, very clearly. Look, we're doing it for two reasons. One, people need to be fed, but not less importantly, people need to make food. We need this at least as much as the people to whom we send the food needs this. And this is a friend of ours who was involved in creating the Jerusalem Hamal, which was sort of the epicenter of a lot of the volunteer activity in Jerusalem, um, in the center of town. Then what happened in the building that um, few people came and they said, let's turn this place into a Hamal, into an operation room. And I joined them. And it's, it's actually it saved me emotionally and uh, spiritually because from that moment I was involved in helping others and I forgot to be afraid. Uh, you know, it, it's, this actually reminds me, Mishki, of this one sentence that you had in, uh, I think, your narration for Agi Michol's. Mm -hmm. We had an episode with a poet named Agi Michol. She's a famous uh, poet, poet in Israel. And we did an episode. Um, she, she took part in this project. Uh, that a, a lot of very prominent Israeli pr uh, writers took part in to help Kibbutz Be'eri write eulogies for the over 100 uh, victims of the kibbutz. And this is, uh, you know, she, she was writing uh, eulogies for people she didn't know. She got information from her relatives. Etc. She did some research and then wrote a eulogy about them. And when she was telling us about that, and I think the, the line that you used was, um, there's apparently a time when even wordsmiths become uh, essential workers. Uh, and I thought that was beautiful. And um, it, I think it, in a way it also captured how 
we felt and our staff felt during those times, just being really, really busy uh, as a way to cope and, and, and put, our, put our content out there as fast as we could. Um, yeah. Um, we tried to tell positive stories because we felt people needed um, encouragement, so we focused on a lot of volunteers and a lot of story story about this this woman who got married. I, remember, I, I love how she she was going to cancel her wedding, and the mother of the groom told her, "Lo dochim smachot." We don't postpone like happy occasions. You have to have it, and uh, and that was uh, that story. Um, and um, one of the main challenges I think we faced with with a lot of the harder stories was that they were just constantly, constantly in flux. Um, things were changing all the time. But of course, we, we knew that we had to tell those stories as well. Um, so this is, for example, a, a story of my friend, Adva. Um, when we, uh, we spoke to her about her sister, uh, who is considered uh, missing. I still don't know what my uh, sister uh, condition is, but... Uh... I decided that for now I will act like she is alive and captured because this is the only thing that I can affect on and change. And uh, if we'll get the bad news that she, is, she was murdered, I will cope with that when it will come. I don't know if it's better for her to be already dead than to be captured and a uh, hostage by the Hamas. She is um, a young, beautiful girl, and they raped women, and they, um, they cut the organs, and they even killed the animals. They killed the dogs, and the cats, and the rabbits, and the goats in those villages. You know, who does that? Why? So those monsters, if they have my sister, I don't know if it's better for her to be alive or dead. I really don't know. And I'm changing my mind for, from a minute to a minute. Yeah, sometimes I prefer her to be alive. And sometimes I'm saying, I hope she, she would rest in peace and won't need to suffer that. So we, we aired this episode, and then a few days after, um, Adva got news that her sister, they found you know, bits of her remains, and she was declared dead. Um, and they, they bur buried what they found of her. And I just remember this moment was such a difficult moment for me, hearing her say that. It's hard in any kind of interview, but this is like your, your, your friend is saying that. It's just really hard to just even keep keep things together as an inter as an interviewer in that situation. And yeah, I mean, just to, uh, you remember, of course, Yochai, but the, the pace of things was, and the uncertainty around everything was so, was so crazy that we were going, we were having these massively intense conversations. Um, you know, we're only playing you certain clips, but, but there are many, many, many more examples of each one of these things. And we would interview people like Adva or like others um, who would tell us about family members who were missing. And by, in the sort of day and a half that it took us to edit it and release it, uh, the, the, the reality had completely changed. Um, and the, it, was, it was all massively challenging also because you know, we, we don't know how to deal with these kind of things. We're not therapists and we're not trauma specialists and we don't have any kind of training. And here we were sitting in living rooms with uh, people who were just broken, shattered people. Uh, this, is, for example, is um, uh, an episode that we released with a man called Omer Ohana, um, whose husband to be he was supposed to get married um, in, I think, October 20th or something like that, and his husband, Sagi Golan, was killed in Beri in the early morning of uh, October 8th. Um, and this is just a little snippet, but this is sort of what that, uh, we were there for half a day basically talking to him, and this is what all of it sounded like. Can you tell us a bit about how that morning went? Take your time, but. Yeah. On that Saturday, yeah. Uh, Woke up on the 7th of October 
into a siren. So you jumped out of bed. He was talking with his team. It all happened like really quickly. I told him, don't be a hero. He was like, we're getting married. In two weeks, we cast. He left. And were you in touch this whole time? We had an equipment that, uh, because both of us were very busy, to, to send their heart to each other on WhatsApp every round hour. Just to know that uh, the other one is okay. We didn't really have the time to, to talk with each other. So, every round hour, two hearts. One for me, one for me. And then he stopped responding. Yeah, so if, I mean, if before maybe we talked a little bit about how working on these wartime diaries did fill us with a sort of a sense of like purpose, like we had we had a mission, we had a part to play. There were also times when when uh, working on these wartime diaries left us feeling incredibly both depleted but but also hopeless. Um, so this this one story that I did with. Um, a uh, Nepali exchange student um, named Luis Rijal. Um, he, he, I actually, uh, I remember this like really vividly. I was talking to him, it was like some really crazy time because he was actually, he ju had just gotten to Nepal uh, and I was sitting in my car not to wake my family up because it was like 3 a.m. or something like that. Just um, explain, he was a Nepali exchange student. He, he was a Nepali exchange student in the south, uh, for agriculture student and he was in a bomb shelter with a bunch of other friends, and, and a, a close, his closest friend there, Luis Rijal, was, uh, was injured and kidnapped to Gaza and is still in Gaza. Um, and at the very end of the interview, um, he sort of turned to me and, and, and said, actually, we'll, we'll just play it. Yeah. I have a request that you, you have to help us try to find out uh, Bibin Joshi. As soon as possible, you, you have to request them I think they will listen to you. Please try to find out is it good or not. So I think, you know, coming from a very poor rural village of Nepal, you had the sense that if he's talking to somebody from New York, he must have, like, the ear of the higher-ups and, like, I could do something to free Bipin. And, and you know, of course, I, I felt... I still feel this, like, helplessness from that conversation. And I still have a picture of Bipin Joshi up in my house because it could have, like... I, I don't know. It's uh, it's really hard sometimes, and and I think we realized pretty quickly from working on these things that we need help. We need help with with coping with this, and um, we brought in our uh, our close friend Shai Shai Satan, who is actually one of the co-founders of the show. But Shai Shai left us and uh, continued on his career, and he became a a psychologist. And Shai actually still is still in reserve duty. Uh, his job in, is in the Miluim. Is he is in charge of the team of psychologists that is in touch with all the families of the missing and uh, and uh, the hostages, families of the hostages. Um, and so he has both. He's a very smart and uh, um, psychologist, and he has that professional background, and he has the actual experience of like talking to all these people who we were also interviewing. And so we wanted to get in, I think there were like two, two reasons or two things we wanted to get from Shai. One is to help us uh, and to take care of our own mental health and the mental health of our producers and our staff and to, to help give them a place to vent and check in. And the other was also to improve our, ourselves because we realized that it's this, these are not regular interviews. You can't conduct yourself in the, in the same way that we're used to. Uh, a lot of the things that, a lot of our wisdom was just not true here. Like you have to be very careful of certain situations and, um, and certain questions. Um, there go. Um, maybe, maybe one person who really captured the essence of, of, of this, and these are things that Chai told us also, is a guy, guy named Tomer Oshri amazing educator from Israel who basically just dropped everything, left and went down to the Dead Sea and overnight established um, three different schools for three different communities, K to 12, 
um, of, of the people who have evacu were evacuated there from the north and the south. Can you say a, a bit about what you've seen from what a lot of these children have gone through? I mean, some of them have come from some of the worst scenes imaginable. I'll say that one of the suggestions I got from a friend of mine, my neighbor, which is a psychologist, he told me, don't ask people how they're doing, just do. Yeah, don't ask people how they're doing, and of course... Uh, and that's hard, it's yeah. hard when you're interviewing them. We've, uh, we've, made, we've made that mistake, it's really hard. Hmm. Can you talk a bit about your, your daughters and how they're doing mental health-wise? Wow, you know, my daughters, they're too young. Tamar, eh... Wow, it's really hard. It's really hard to talk about it. I don't know, it's too much for me. This is like a simple, relatively like straightforward question for us to ask, but pe people were not able to answer these type of questions. And sometimes we made the mistake of asking questions, and sometimes we made the mistake of not asking questions. You know, we were hearing such a quantity of stories in those right. early days that sometimes things only after we recorded them and we were editing, we were like, "Wait, what? And how didn't we? How didn't we ask about that?" So, uh, an example that stuck in my mind is we were talking to some reservist um, who was telling us about being in Gaza um, and how they were, you know, occupying different different houses and different homes uh, during their time in Gaza. And then he sort of casually mentioned um, that in one of the places that they had stayed in... Um, uh, we had, we had, in one of the houses, we have some uh, old man. Who, we don't know how, but he just stayed in his house the whole war. So he was with us for two weeks. Of course, under guard and everything, so nothing bad happened to him or to us, but... He was there. Uh, he was a nice, uh, nice old man, nice old Palestinian man. Wow. So yes, yeah, so we just talk about life, um, jokes. We started playing poker, and then we just left. We just left that as if it's a very normal situation for a team of combat soldiers to be occupying some elderly Palestinian's home and for him to be there and be playing poker with them. I mean, it's so surreal, right? It could be a synopsis for some sort of... Uh, some what, what would you ask him, Mishi, if you could go back everything, to Everything, everything about that situation. Yeah. Um, but, um, so, so there were, as you were saying, there were all kinds of challenges of what to ask and what not to ask and so on and so forth. And also, I mean, it's important to remember that um, we were hearing a lot of different opinions. And, you know, we aren't um, some sort of, we're not external to the situation. We are also Israelis also going through all of this as we're hearing about all of this. And, um, you know, we're accustomed to hearing, uh, to hearing perspectives that are different than our own. That's what we do all the time on Israel Story. But here we were often hearing opinions that we were so radically and diametrically opposed to that it was difficult because we wanted on the one hand, I mean, we're, we are ourselves people who have opinions and so on and so forth, but it was important for us to expose our audience and our listeners to the range of opinions. Um, so for example, um, we, we, we spoke um, to a man called Tzvika Mor, who, uh, whose son, Eitan, is a hostage, is, was kidnapped from the Nova, um, Nova uh, party. And he lives in an ideologically um, right-wing settlement called uh, Kiryat Arba, which is near, near Hebron. And um, well, I'll play you a little bit of, of his uh, position, which is very clearly an outlying position. We have a responsibility. We have a role, a special role. We have to teach the people of Israel because after decades of uh, Western liberal thinking, um, the default will be to think only about the hostages. But we are in a war. We're talking about the life of 
all this state. So if we want to continue to live here, we have to sacrifice, okay? My responsibility is not only for my family and my relatives and my friends, but for all my nation. So, Tzvika, let me ask you, I, I'm sure you pray every day that Eitan comes home safely and lives a full and healthy life. That obviously goes without saying, and amen, amen. amen. Mm-hmm. But just to ask you, you, you would prefer to sacrifice Eitan's life for a success in winning this war? Look, all this thing that Israel is uh, negotiating with terrorists, it's crazy, okay? In the 70s, it was very, very clear that Israel do not speak with the terrorists, okay? Uh, Savoy Hotel, Sabena Airplane, uh, Entebbe, but now it came uh, a default that Israel negotiating with terrorists, and I think that it, it's terrible. And it's uh, ridiculous that you are in a war, you want uh, to make your enemy weak, and you are paying to him? <laughs> I was just going to ask, just to, what's your wife's name? Efrat. Efrat. She's totally with you on this? Yes, of course. Really? Yes, 100%. We have the same approach. So, you know, Yochai, I, I sat with Tzvika for several hours in our studio and we were talking and these were, these, it's, these are, as I can uh, only imagine that you, you also feel, these are pretty radical views. Um, and after we got, after we were finished with our conversation, I walked him out to the parking lot and we stood for another hour or so in, in the parking lot, Tzvika and I, and... I said to him, you know, Tzvika, it's really interesting. Um, your views challenge me uh, profoundly. Um, and I got to tell you, I'm on the complete opposite side of the political spectrum as you are. And for the last 20 odd years, I have gone every single week to demonstrate against people like you and against you being able to live where you live and so on and so forth. And yet, interestingly, and this is sort of one of these things that make reality in Israel and reality just in the world so complicated, your message about sort of collectivism and and, uh, responsibility for the nation and stuff like that are actually messages that that in my mind seem to fit more with sort of the socialist uh, viewpoint of of the Mapainikim who established the state. I could imagine, you know, Beryl Katzenelson or Tabenkin talking in, in such a way. And today it's a sort of radical right-wing opinion. And in fact, he left the forum of the, uh, of the families of the hostages because he, he, he is... He, has, he didn't fit. Yeah, yeah he, yeah. he knows. Um, so it was opinions like that, or the opinion of a woman that we met um, called Datya Itzhaki, who was evacuated um, in 2005 together with your sister, uh, Yochai, um, from, from Gaza. She was a settler in, in Gush Katif. Um, and she now feels some sort of partially vindicated because they, uh, one of their big talking points back in the disengagement was that if we leave Gush Katif, Hamas will take over. And, um, and she um, now wants to return to Gaza. So You would be willing to move uh, if, if, the, if the army gave, and the government gave you the green light in, in a month, in 30 days, they said you can go back to no electricity on the beach. Would you be up for it? Yes, for sure. You know, home is a lot more than, than an apartment. Home is a place that gives you the, the feeling of security, of, of something else. And that only was in Kfariam. <sighs> so, I mean, I, I just want to say a few words about sort of unity. I mean, after October 7th, I think there was this really strong feeling, a lot of people really, I think there was a yearning to feel a unity that we felt slipping away in the days before October 7th. 
and there is something about a common tragedy and a war that, of course, brings people together. Uh, and people were very much grieving, and there's, there was a sense of, of sort of a communal return to togetherness that was very strong. Um, just, to, just to sort of give you an example of this, this is, um, this is a reservist named uh, Noam Tsurieli, uh, who is describing in this clip two of his uh, platoon mates, uh, Gal Eisenkot and Eyal Berkovich, uh, who were both killed in action. Gal was uh, 25, uh, from Herzliya, non-religious at all, you know, living life, uh, skiing a lot, was there for, for months, and they come back and partying. He has lots of friends from the Nova. He was also supposed to be at the Nova the same night. At the end, he changed his plan. And the other hand was his couple. In, in the army, you have, uh, we call it metal couple, like Tzemet Barzel, like the one you go with and you never leave. So uh, his couple... Uh, Eyal Berkovich was the most religious from their crew, married, 30 years old, really serious, really always ab about respecting uh, everybody, learning uh, Gemara while he can, like he was their little rabbi. And the fact that those two fought together, after all we know what's happening in Israel uh, for a year now, I think, and fought together and died together, it's uh, just a lesson about um, we need to be worthy of their death. Like, they didn't fight for us to continue fighting one another. Yeah, so Noam captures, I think, really well this sort of yearning of everybody to, to be united at this kind of terrible time. And sometimes it was, for me at least, useful to actually get a bit of an outside perspective um, on, on what was going on to remind myself of some harder truths. Uh, so maybe maybe she, maybe she could play this short clip from uh, Doron Krakow, who's actually a New Yorker, I think. Uh, and he was, uh, until recently, the, the president of the JCCA. Um, and in this interview, he, I think he helped remind me that this unity might be more temporary than I, I was hoping, and that the cracks are, are sure to reemerge. Look, I think that at all times, our strength as a Jewish community and as a Jewish people comes from the recognition that the things we share in common are far more important than the things over which we disagree. And we discover, in particularly difficult times, that the significance of that is amplified a great deal. So while I think these first weeks after the nightmare of October 7th has seen us rally uh, in all parts of the Jewish world, will be tested as time goes by with the knowledge that the war is likely to be a protracted one. Uh, and the images of the war, as we move further and further away from the 7th of October, are images that uh, will reflect less well when it comes to what the critics are interested in talking about. And it's interesting, Yochai, because when there was a re as you, as you said there was a real sense of all being together in the same boat um, in the first weeks and few months of the war and in fact that impacted sort of the range of things that one could say also um, there was there was it, it was sort of as you re remember I mean people were saying that this is not time to voice any dissent this is not time to demonstrate. And one of the most surprising things, at least for me, uh, that um, have happened is, you know, you expect these kind of mega events like, like a war to really um, have an impact and to basically be kind of an earthquake that reshuffles the cards. Um, but today, the, um, where you stood on the judicial reform is the greatest predictor of what you think about almost every, anything that has to do with the war. So whether you think that there should be a deal uh, to release the hostages, whether you think that uh, the government should, uh, Bibi should, should resign, whether you think that the IDF should go into Rafiach, um, there's been very, very little movement between, uh, between camps in Israel, which is really both a surprising and uh, depressing and fascinating element of this war. And I want to say all of that because it's 
crucial um, to remember where we were on October 6th. Um, and you know, we, we all know that, but we knew that from a um, particularly um, um, interesting vantage point because about a year and a half ago, um, in the sort of thinking about Israel's 75th um, Yom Atzmaut, the 75th birthday, we decided to embark on this pretty ambitious project which we had been working on for a year and which we were sort of releasing when October 7th uh, happened. And that project was a project um, that centered on Israel's Declaration of Independence. And we, um, over the course of a year, we located the closest living relative of each one of the 37 men and women who signed Israel's Declaration of Independence. And we went to talk to them. And we released uh, episodes about each one of these signatories. And it was, you know, the reason that we were doing this was because we wanted to see how a generation and a half later, um, what had happened, had, how people thought about this sort of um, unusual idea of creating a Jewish and democratic entity. Um, and it's particularly interesting to think about it in the context of America, that out of the 30, all 37 of the signatories uh, are, are dead, but um, 14 of them still have children who are alive. And we talked to all of those people. And we learned fascinating, fascinating things um, so three out of the 37 signatories were ultra-Orthodox Jews, and yet about 60% of the descendants living today of the people who signed the Declaration of Independence are ultra-Orthodox Jews. Um, and we heard a range of opinions from people saying that Israel is a Judeo-Nazi entity, all the way to people saying that democracy is a... Uh, uh, a foreign uh, Greek import and not something that we should aspire to. So we brought you a little clip of sort of the range of voices that we heard in that project, which really informed our understanding of where Israel was um, and how we were tearing at the seams going in to um, the catastrophe of October 7th. My father, I really saw him very little because he was imprisoned by the British what they call Jewish terrorists. And my father signed this declaration. Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence. To sign it was a very exciting thing. I am the grandson of the person who signed tenth in the Megillat Atzma. Uh, John Hancock on the Israeli Declaration of Independence in terms of size is Ben-Gurion's. But my grandfather's is the one that stands out most. My grandfather didn't marry women. Women married my grandfather. When I was coming home from school, he was there for me. We had five o'clock tea. When I played with my friends in the yard on Shabbos, I remember my father calling me to come up and study with him the Gemara, the Talmud. He had a beautiful tenor voice. He sang beautifully. He did not Israel. My father looked at all our homework. He always looked at everything we did. He brought two eggs back with him from the signing. And she said, this is the best thing that came out of the declaration. <laughs> you can see the roots of the fascism we are living today in this document. But I think he would have been very proud of the democratic character of Israel. My father thought that we will have to give back Judea and Samaria. But we were one of the early settlers. He never thought it would be in a situation like this. The religious people try to force the religion. We are dealing in lies. My father will be proud that Israel is Israel. I don't know if he would have been so happy with them. No, I don't think so. Our democracy is in trouble. Now that there is a right-wing government, I'm very happy. And if he was here, he will be ashamed. He would have been annoyed by the fact that in his neighborhood, Rahavia, there are so many Haredi Jews. The choice will be between losing the Jewish majority. The danger right now is very great. The country is beautiful. Or justifying the accusations that we're an apartheid state. The people of Israel 
על השיט. I'm sorry that I fought for a country that is not what he wanted. There is, um, I think, a self-hatred. Israel became now the state of apartheid. This is our country, and we have the right to be here like any other people in the world. My father is very happy to see the religious aspects of Israel today. It was a vision that went down the drain. By the way, the person saying that Israelis are shits and that it's a vision that went down the drain and all of that, that actually is Ben-Kurion's grandson. Uh, you know, just listening to that, Mishka, I was wondering, may, maybe there is something that did change from, from then to now. Is, I, I what? Think, so if, if thinking back to that era of working on SSD in Israel back then, all of the discourse, all of the rifts, were sort of around civil issues, like how should our Supreme Court look and democracy and the sort of classic political divide of Israel, which was all around the conflict and the Palestinians, um, sort of was almost like forgotten or neglected. And uh, obviously I feel like that kind of come back, come back with a vengeance. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I'm not 100% sure I agree with you about that. But what, um, what was very tangible um, was that so many people, including people um, in sort of my left-wing circles um, who had been out um, with me endlessly demonstrating uh, against the occupation and uh, so on and so forth in those early days of the of the war were saying again and again that you know they felt that they didn't have the capacity or the bandwidth to be able to hear the other side or to hear about other pain um, I remember someone saying I have a thousand four hundred cells in my heart and all of them are filled and I can't hear anything about uh, pain or suffering in Gaza. Uh, here's, here's you know, a, a, another example of that. You cannot take both pains, and you cannot feel both pains. It's, it's too much pain for one person to carry around. It's too much, you know? And, you know, we, we wanted to profile a very broad spectrum and to present a very sp broad spectrum of opinions. Um, and um, what was, you know, we were, we were running this show for the first month and a half or something. We were running a daily show. So it was like <laughs> the New York Times daily, except that they have a staff of about 60 people and the entire operation of the New York Times behind them. And we were six of us. Um, and uh, and, and try trying to create this, this daily show. Um, but uh, what the first 20 odd or so episodes of this series had in common is that they all came from a mainstream Israeli Jewish perspective. Um, and I was very interested in showing other perspectives as well. And the first episode that we released um, like that, which we did with a lot of trepidation, as you remember, um, was an episode in which we, ironically, actually was with another Jewish Israeli uh, woman, uh, but she was telling the story of her close friend who was a Gazan peace activist um, who she had been texting with, uh, who, who was a close friend of hers and she had been texting with uh, since, uh, since October 7th. Uh, here she is. Like a message after that, he writes, my family members who lost their lives in the Israeli bombing will always be the source of power to go on in this long way to struggle, and we won't give up. Um, and then, yeah, the last text that I have from him, um, I tell him, so I'm like, sorry to hear about your family members. More and more people and names and stories just adding to a list of pain that continues to grow. So he writes me, hence our role as human rights activists and freedom fighters. And that was October 27th, and by October 30th, uh, he was dead. You know, you text friends in Gaza, it's kind of texting them just to see if they respond, just to see if they are alive. And I, I texted them again, after I was told 
So I'm kind of like, just, just in case he answers. What did you text? It was, are you here? This feels so strange to send and ask. Um, but that was never received. It's still unread. So maybe today, uh, you know, on May 9th, 2024, that doesn't sound like such a radical perspective to, to air. But when we aired it, um, it, it really felt that way. It felt as if we were saying something that was so far out of the consensus of what was possible to say in Israel in those days. And in fact, I remember being in the interview feeling that I needed to stand in for the enraged uh, listener. So, um, so I, I, I asked. I'm sure listeners will want to know, so I just want to give you the opportunity to, to clarify that. Khalid was not uh, a member of the Hamas or involved or supportive of the Hamas. Khalid was not. And it feels almost ridiculous to have to say it. Like, this is a person who's like literally talked about nonviolence and the importance of nonviolence his entire life, including criticism within Gaza about it, you know? That doesn't keep him, save him. And forget even about Khalid. Like, about his two daughters. Like, how many of us ask? This question of, like, um, I think that maybe people are saying, like, so who, who in his family was, was a terrorist, right? Because, like, in our minds, it's the houses of terrorists that are being bombed. Um, and I, 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 I'm, I'm not a military person. I don't know what the, but it's, like, entire tar- apartment buildings, you know, entire neighborhoods. So I don't know. Maybe one of his neighbors was a target. Maybe, like, I don't know who the target was there. All I know is that him and everyone he loved is dead. I'm sure you remember, Mish, but I, I was one of the people who had a really hard time with this episode, and me and Mishi argued a lot around this episode. I think I, I was, I didn't have space to hear this, to hear this story, and I felt it was, like, too soon. Um, and it's really interesting because actually listening to this episode again in preparation for speaking to you all today, I, I found a lot more space in my heart now to hear her talk about, about her uh, friend who died in Gaza and, and everything that's going on in Gaza in general. But back then I couldn't, I couldn't hear it. Um, but then also like listening to this episode, I had like another, another bit of criticism for, and, and also I remember we argued about this back then, um, this episode and all the episodes where we have people sort of giving views that are sort of way out of the mainstream, we have this tendency to give long uh, kind of like preliminary intros. Kind of like, I, I felt, and I, this is what I told Mishi, that it's like we're, we're, we're like apologizing, unnecessarily apologizing. Like if we're putting Shachar Vardi's story out there and her friend from Gaza, just put it out there. You don't need to give all this intro like explaining why we did it, justifying ourselves and everything. Um, but when I listen to it now again, I think I understood why we did it. And I think, you know, we're talking about, what we're talking here essentially is, is pushing the narrative. And I think both Mishi and I and the, the, the DNA of our show has this like instinct to try to push the narrative, to try to push people out of their comfort zone of what they're usually thinking and let them see life from a different perspective. And it's very easy as a show, to just look, okay, who's, wh- which demographic haven't we brought, which perspective haven't we brought, and just bring them and pat ourselves on the shoulder, okay, we have diversity. But the real challenge is to actually create um, listening and create dialogue and, and bring people to a place where they can actually listen to that other view and not just do it for the sake of, you know, this, I don't know, some, ultra, some bigger ideal. Yeah, absolutely, and and, yeah. and and it's challenging sometimes yeah. because you know when people say things like this, for example, mm-hmm. let's say the war ends, Israel destroys Hamas, that there's still going to be two million Palestinians in Gaza. Two million terrorists in Gaza. Everybody, everybody, no one stop this. So, I don't care about the children of the enemy. I don't care because these children of Hamas now will be the killer of my children when they go to grown up. So I don't care about them. I think they not deserve to the life. They don't deserve to, to anything. 
maybe they can go to Canada, to Europe. All the people that, that thinking, oh, the poor Palestine, take them. Take the poor Palestine, take care of them. We don't want to live close to them anymore. Never again. So when we air something like that, which we know will be perceived in a certain way by our listeners, we want them to be able to actually consider what she's saying and to hear it. Um, so we go to great lengths to try to make people's statements, even if they're um, you know, inflammatory statements like, like this one, be within a certain context. So that, that, for example, is the very end of an episode where for the 20 minutes beforehand, we heard about this woman, Shira's um, journey in the last few months of having to leave her home in Sderot with her five kids and uh, the, what it meant to live in various different hotels and being moved from one to the other and how it disturbed her family life and her, her parents husband ha- standing with a knife guarding the door in Sderot. And, right. Yeah. And by the and and moving and kids losing school years and uh, sh- her feeling that she is isn't the kind of mother that she wants to be anymore and that she's lost her parental authority and so on and so forth. And by the time you hear this statement, you're actually kind of invested in her story and you can understand where she's coming from. It's not to say that I agree with her. I completely do not agree with her. But we want to. We wanted to allow listeners the ability to to understand why she says something like this. I mean, one one thing I don't know if you noticed this, but in, in hearing sort of Shira's statement, Shira Masmi, that's the the last woman we heard talk, you hear a very strong conviction in her voice, and. One thing that I, I mean that really struck me is that very quickly a lot of Israelis sort of converged into having very strong convictions and opinions about what should happen and what are the reasons for what happens and um, and it left me feeling very inadequate in a way because I I am still I think very very confused both about why like why what's happening what do I think about what's happening. I don't have, it's weird to like stand here in front of you and talk with you and be confused like this, but this is, this is my state. Um, and it, um, it, it brings me back to like this one, one interview that maybe this is the most powerful moment for me in all of, all of Wartime Diaries. Um, I, I know from, we have close, a close friend who lives in a place called Wacht Salam, Neve Shalom in Israel. It's a very unique place where Jews and uh, Jews and Arabs purposefully will go to live together, to raise their kids together, go to the same school, etc. And I knew from from our friend that that village was the the community was falling apart. Uh, it wasn't like some of the Jewish members were going to reserves duty and serving in Gaza, and of course others were had families in Gaza, and and things were 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 falling apart. And I wanted to to do a story about it. Um, and I found this uh, young man called Adam Ben Shabbat, who was actually born there, um, and he agreed to talk to me. Adam actually told me that his like core identity is like before he was Jewish or Israeli. Adam is from Neve Shalom, Machtes Salam. I grew up in a Zionist house. My father really pushed me to to go to the military because the first thing that we need is defense. Like I understand the meaning and the importance of the of the military in this area. This is one part of me. But the other thing is that I know what this military is doing, and I think this war really brought me to to a hard identity crisis because all the open questions that I had just open up more after the seventh of October. You know, when you carry within yourself two narratives, it's, it, it feels um, impossible. Like every day I'm trying to find answers to those questions. And that the only thing that I came up with is I want the other side, the Palestinian that lives with me to have this identity crisis. And this is when I will know that we are partners. Yes, I mean, what, what Adam said this year, I really feel like I, I've, I've been taking it with me ever since because I was, like I said, walking around with this feeling of, of not knowing after October 7 and doubts and questions, and I didn't know 
what to think and it's almost like Adam gave me like this permission or even instructions to stay with those doubts that there was like an uh, there was a actually value in questioning and in not knowing and to, to really so I've really been almost actively trying to hold on to that and, and not to reach conclusions and to be more open uh, I think you're in the minority in 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 that Yochai, because I think that actually what we were hearing again and again is that shifting identities and stable identities and political sensibilities um, were were um, hardening and solidifying and it was especially hard for people um, to sort of embrace the uncertainty as as you as you did Yochai in these raw moments of shock and, and pain where there isn't that much room for complexity um, and people are forced to retreat sort of into their own corners. Um, early on we had talked to a woman um, who is very active in Jewish Arab sort of coexistence circles uh, called, called Mo, uh, who told us this, which was something that stayed with me. Many of my friends who are Jewish who were in these coexistence groups with me, have blocked me, have said things like, one of the girls in the WhatsApp group that we, we run, she came back into the group just to say, I hope your wives and children are murdered and raped the way you did to us, and then left the group. And I can understand that. It's not okay what she said, but I can understand everybody needs their, like, blankie, their their teddy bear, something to make them feel safe. There's not a one-size-fits-all message right now. I think the, I don't even think we want to hear it right now, and that's okay. We just need to settle in our pain for now and support each other, even if it means each side supporting their own, until we feel safe again. So today I have to just make space for, for everybody. And one heart can't do that. And that brings me, Yochai, to uh, want to address which, what I think is, in many ways, sort of the biggest pitfall of our work in the last seven months, and also kind of the elephant in the room, which is that all of the voices that you heard up until now were all Jews, all of them. And that is not representative of our work in general, we have had over the years many, 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 many non-Jews on the show. Many Arabs, many Palestinians. Uh, and um, it was important for us um, to do so in wartime diaries as well. And we worked tirelessly to get Arab voices onto the show. And for a long time, this was a very, very difficult and challenging task because there was fear everywhere. I live in a mixed Jewish Arab neighborhood in Jerusalem. Um, mixed is maybe a little bit of a euphemism. It's more like a split Jewish Arab neighborhood, but in any event, it is a Jewish Arab neighborhood. And on the corner of my own street for the first, I would say, six weeks or so, seven weeks after October 7th, Every morning, there, were, uh, there was a little checkpoint um, manned by folks by the sh from the Shabak who would stop every single teenage Arab um, uh, boy coming up from, uh, from, from a Butor and from Silwan and confiscate their phone and go through all of their WhatsApp history and all of their Facebook posts. And if they had by chance posted a verse from the Quran, um, with a uh, green background, um, you know, around October 7th, that meant that they were going to be detained or that they were going to be visited that night by investigators. And um, this kind of fear went in every way. I mean, in my, one of the most depressing things, that, it sounds so small that I'm almost embarrassed to, to say it almost, but one of the things that depressed me most about this entire period was that on October 8th in the morning in our building's WhatsApp group, 
um, the tenants decided unanimously, we're, we're just renters, so we don't get to participate in these kind of conversations, but the, t the tenants, the homeowners decided unanimously to fire the Arab man who cleans the, um, cleans the stairwell uh, and to change the, uh, the password for the entrance because they, they were afraid. And, and, and I can't totally blame them, but it's, but it's, it's totally depressing. Um, and we, we, we really worked very, very hard to try to get Arab voices onto the show. Most people were afraid. There were people who agreed to talk to us. And the truth of the matter is that often the people who did agree to, tell, to talk to us, Arabs who did agree to talk to us and to record interviews, said things that we felt that we didn't want to air. Um, that were so crazy. I mean, people saying that October 7th was all AI um, and never happened. And we felt, okay, well, we're not going to use our platform that reaches hundreds of thousands of people around the world to, to share that kind of, uh, that ki those kind of views. That's, that's, that's crazy. Mm. Um, and since then, we have actually improved and we have uh, gotten um, both Druze and Bedouins and Palestinians onto the onto the show as time has passed. Also, the story has evolved. The first um, Arab voice that we got onto the show was a was a Bedouin from Rahat, um, who tried to explain the complexity of his own um, situation, um, and I think did so actually quite quite beautifully. Nineteen Bedouin were killed, both by rockets and by gunmen, in Kibbutz Beeri and in Reim. Bedouins were killed by Hamas. What can I tell you? The rocket that comes flying out of Gaza is blind. It doesn't discern between a Jew and an Arab. Fact is, it hit our people. Seven Bedouins were kidnapped to Gaza. One of them is my brother-in-law, who was taken captive. His name is Farhan, Farhan al-Kadi, and he worked as a security guard near Kibbutz Reim. Is he alive? Is he dead? We don't know. This whole thing puts us in a very difficult and complex predicament. I mean, we're between a rock and a hard place. Why? Because large parts of our extended family live across the border. See, I come from the Tarabin tribe, and 70% of our tribe live in Gaza, all the way from the north of the Strip down to Rafia in the south. Some of them were killed in the Israeli bombings, even though they have no affiliation with Hamas. They're just innocent people sitting in their homes, and then a missile comes and destroys them. It hurts us, of course, just as it hurts every Jew who is harmed. A child in Gaza is equal to a Jewish child here. It sounds cliche, but we are all human beings. We all have the same blood, and all this needs to come to an end. And it's difficult for us, especially because we feel we're targets on both sides. We're hurt both here as Israelis and there as Gazans. So the story is um, obviously very complicated and, and a shifting one and an ongoing one and one that we're still trying to understand and to follow in all kinds of ways. Uh, but I think, um, because we do want to leave time for some questions, a good place to end, uh, Yochai, um, is to talk about the future. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when, when, we, uh, when we were first organizing this event with Michal and Rabbi Mo, I think one of the requests they had of us is that we don't, we don't come with an event that's too sad and depressing, which is actually a really hard ask, to be honest, because, you know, what's, with, everything that, with everything that's going on, it's not, not ex not, we're not exactly feeling super positive. And even more important than finishing on a high note, um, we felt we feel a responsibility towards you all to be very, very truthful and honest. Um, so it was a big, a big challenge. And uh, our first move was maybe we decided to just sort of take that question to the street uh, and and sort of try and give you a picture of what's going on, on in a random sampling um, in Israel. Yeah. 
משתדלים להיות אופטימיים, משתדלים מאוד, לא רוצים לאבד את התקווה. שם שלי טיקי, תקווה, אני חייבת להיות עם תקווה. שאלה מורכבת, אני חייבת להיות אופטימית. אם לא אופטימית, אני לא אהיה פה. אבל אני חייבת להגיד לך שזה מאוד קשה להיות אופטימי. The world will come to see the truth about this nation and the right to this land, this promised land. I believe that's going to happen. אני תמיד אופטימי, כי א', זה מה שמחזיק אותנו. בלי אופטימיות, אנחנו היינו נכחדים מזמן. אני יודע שהוא יחזור, אין פה, זו לא שאלה מבחינתי אם הוא יחזור או לא יחזור. ברור לי שהוא יחזור, השאלה רק מתי. As far as uh, what's happening in America, I think we're losing uh, support, what with the uh, young people. One day they're going to be the leaders of the country and they've got a certain anti-Semitic bent. Uh, so... You're not very optimistic. Well, I am optimistic. I think we survive. We always have survived. Us Jews have always survived, and I think we will continue to survive. I don't think that we will see a return. Because the world is full of people who are bad. Who don't understand. This is the problem. It will be good. The Lord is with us all the time. We need to believe that the Messiah is coming and will come again. We are here in Jerusalem. We are going to pray about this. It is strong that the Messiah will come and will come quickly, 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 in the name of God. So, Yochai, what, what, would you, uh, what would you answer? Are you optimistic? Me? I mean, my, if my wife was here, she would, she, would, she would say that I'm like the biggest pessimist ever. I, I like to think of myself as a realist, but, you know, I had a feeling you would ask me this question. So, I actually, I was thinking about it a little bit, and, you know, it occurred to me, me and Mishi are constantly on the phone analyzing and talking about this series, series and thinking, you know, what are we missing? Who should we talk to next? But one of the big conversations that we keep coming back to, and I think, I think it started maybe like a, a three weeks in already, is um, when and how to end the Wartime Diaries series. Like, how do we transition out of this series back into the regular stories that we love to do, just regular love stories, you know, all kinds of regular people with crazy stories, as we like to say. And it occurred to me that just, just that fact in that fact, maybe there's like a hidden optimism that eventually all of this will, will be something of the past and we will go back to doing regular stories and that somehow all of, this, all of these horrible events will lead to a positive outcome. So maybe like a hidden optimism in there somewhere. What about, what about you, Mishi? <laughs> it's a simple yes, no question. It's not a... Oh, yeah, <laughs> sure. Um... Look, this has been an incredibly, incredibly um, difficult period for all of us. Um, and putting aside all of the personal loss, you know, we have close friends who have, uh, have a son who's, uh, who's kidnapped, uh, uh, a friend who was killed in Gaza, um, and putting aside all of the, the, this, this sort of personal loss, I think that um, for me this has been an ongoing lesson in keeping in my head and in my heart at the same time sort of the worst and the best of humanity. And when I say the worst and the best, I don't mean Hamas as opposed to civil society in Israel, just the worst and the best on all fronts, right? Um, which is full of cruelty and kindness and violence and generosity and thinking about how these, these two things can live together and how humanity can be so, so awful and so beautiful at the same time. And you know, they used to say about this, um, they used to say about this uh, left-wing Israeli politician called Yossi Sarid um, in Israel that he was a uh, lover of humanity but hated uh, human beings. <laughs> and, um, and I think that in the last seven months, I've learned the exact opposite lesson. I think very, very uh, negative things, honestly, about humanity. Um, but I've learned through wartime diaries, really, to love humans and, and 
um, even humans who I don't share very much with. Um, and, you know, a moment that encapsulated that for me, the, that sort of, that, that understanding about, about the humanity of humans was a moment. So um, John, uh, John Poland, um, whose son Hirsch is, uh, is uh, a hostage, is a friend uh, and has actually for several years now been helping Israel's story in all kinds of um, uh, capacities. And um, of course, been in close touch with them since October 7th. And Rachel uh, Goldberg, John's, um, John's wife, um, told me something which uh, stuck with me. Um, and this will be what we end with. And then uh, we'll open mm -hmm. it up for some questions and answers. She told me about a Zoom call that um, happened shortly after October 7th between families of uh, missing people who had American uh, citizenship and President Biden. And um, the, there was a woman on this call um, whose two daughters um, had been at the Nova party and were missing. And in the several days between when the call was set up and when it actually happened, she was notified that one of her daughters had been uh, identified and was, was dead. Um, and still she had uh, one daughter who was still missing, so she participated in the call with, uh, with, with the president and the other families. And this is uh, Rachel describing that call. And she stood up at one point. Someone else was talking. He wanted to hear everyone's story. And she stood up and she went to like the door of the room she was in. She was out for a minute and she comes back in and she's like walking around, sort of like throwing her arms in the air. And she hits something on her computer, which was the mute button, which all of us had had our mute buttons on. And she says, I have to interrupt. I have to interrupt. And the president was speaking at the time and he said, yeah, go ahead. And she said, I just got the, the door knock that my other daughter is dead. And she started screaming. And we all, 12 of us, started crying on the call. And he put his hands in his, you know, his head in his hands and started sobbing. And it was so powerful because we were so with her. Um, and what was really amazing is he... He, he wiped his eyes and he said, I'm telling you right now, I have lost two children. And I know right now you're in, un, in an unimaginable agony. But one day you are going to need to be strong for the rest of your family. So scream and you can scream to me as much as you want. And if you need me to, I'll call you tomorrow and you can keep screaming at me. <laughs> he said, but you're going to need to allow yourself to be there for your family. And I just thought it was just a real human moment. And I know that it's very Western and very American and very touchy feely, but you know what? We've been in hell for 12 days now. And it was a, it was a moment. It was a whisper of somebody getting the pain and that will always stay with me. So that's a little uh, taste of what we've been doing. Um, and uh, thank you all for listening. And, um, and we're happy if anyone has any questions. <laughs> Good. The, the, there's always a fear that no one will have a question. So when a lot of hands go up together right. immediately, that's always a good sign. So before we open the floor to a lot of questions, um, I want to thank both of you for sharing all of these stories, for all of these voices, um, for all of these perspectives that we need to hear. We really only get to hear from one person at a time, and you have brought us Israel. And we're just so grateful to both of you. We're also grateful to our partners at Park Avenue Synagogue, the 92nd Street Y, and Central Synagogue, who have put this amazing community of people together tonight. 
And now, from this amazing community of people, we'll take a handful of your questions. You can choose. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sure everyone joins me in, in thanking you sincerely for coming here. Um, Mishy, my good friend Terry Hendon, told me I should say hi to you. Um, obviously, what you're doing here uh, beyond Israel Story is collecting a, a precious trove of oral history of a moment in time that is going to become historically, or it is already historically, so important. And I wanted to know who's collecting your stories. I hope you taped this conversation today. But who's collecting your story about what you're doing and how you intend to tell this story of, of yourselves going forward? That's, that's really interesting. It's actually not something that we've talked about. Um, I've started to think now about how we want to mark October 7th. And I have um, some idea of creating a uh, physical space that will include um, all these stories um, and, and portraits and so on and so forth of, of uh, and, and be it like a place that you can come and visit. We're part of many, many initiatives with the National Library in Israel, uh, with various different ministries and municipalities and so on and so forth. Uh, we're depositing all of, uh, all of um, our material that we're collecting in various different archives. Um, it's important to say we played you um, out of the 50 wartime diaries that we've aired thus far, I think we played clips from maybe half of them or something like that. But uh, but in addition to the 50 that we aired, there are several hundred that we didn't air. So we've really been talking to many, 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 many people. And even in the things that I said that we were not going to air, right? I mean, like, you know, the, the Arab voices who said that even that has significance, um, you know, historically in, in, in terms of understanding the complexity of the moment. Um, so it's something that we're, we, is, is very much in our mind. I don't know if you want to add to that. I, I mean, I, do, I can say that this is being recorded, and, uh, yeah, and, and so that, that's part of your question, so that's a good thing. And, uh, and for the other, other half, I don't know, maybe when, maybe when we retire. And we're too busy collecting other people's stories, I think, to write down our own right now. Um. It's not really a question. I want the people to know that the people in the, the Gaza area, the, the kibbutzim, they were in very good relationship with the Palestinians. The Palestinians worked in the kibbutzim. Those people took the Palestinians that got permission to be treated in a hospital in Israel. They did that. And one woman said, October 7, a terrorist that she recognized him, came into her house, killed her husband in front of her. She said, after what she was interviewed, she said, no more two-state solution. No more poor Palestinians. They are vicious. She's done with them. It's it's interesting because um, uh, one clip that we didn't that we didn't play, but perhaps would be interesting as as a, a reaction to what you just said, is that there was a very interesting um, dynamic between the people, the settlers who lived in Gush Katif in Gaza, and the kibbutz members. Um, who are largely um, belong to the, to the left in 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 Israel, and one of the women who had left Gaza um, told us about how, what a fraught relationship that was um, during the disengagement because um, the the um, the kibbutznikim who are now unfortunately many of them were, were were slaughtered on October 7th were the ones that were sort of most active in pushing for the disengagement here's a little clip uh, in which she 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 reflects on that and then we end out of the Gaza region and our neighbors from the kibbutzim were standing there and cheering because they're taking us of the Gaza region <laughs> They, they were they were like standing on the street on the side just cheering yeah <sighs> um, I wanted to thank you so much I'm a big uh, 
and I'm a devotee of Israel story, thanks to my daughter who interned with you. And um, and after October 7th, I always, I, I like all your stories and the music that you always introduce at the end. And since October 7th, the songs that you put at the end have helped me to kind of breathe deep and kind of incorporate my thoughts again. And Mishi, I think you said in one of your episodes something like, even if you feel the pain for the other, it's okay to feel more pain for your own. And that was very, it kind of, uh, it was soothing to understand I could feel for the other, but somehow the pain of my own somehow felt very, very, very strong. And I almost had like your permission to feel not indifferent to the other pain, but very in touch with the pain of my own. So thank you very much. Thank you. We'll take one or two more questions before inviting folks to sure. have a little bit more of a, um, a casual conversation with one another, with Yochai and Mishi, um, and to uh, enjoy some comfort food, which I think maybe we all need after, after what we've heard. So another question. Hi, thank you so much for speaking. Um, so I'm an aspiring journalist, and something that you talked a lot about was doing these interviews with people who you disagree with so much. And I want to know a little bit more about how you're able to handle those situations when, when the line is too far, of when it's just something that you really can't hear, or when you feel like it's your responsibility to have those opinions be heard, even if you disagree with them. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I think it depends a lot on the medium you're working with and the, the, the specifics of the situation. But I think it's important for a journalist to, to uh, suspend judgment. But it's, it's kind of a tricky dance that you're trying to do because you're trying to come very open, open-hearted and open-minded, which are two different things, um, and, and just be very genuinely curious without being judgmental. But on the other hand, you still have to have that little bit of criticism where you're able to sort of jump in and call people out on certain things. Not in a mean way or in a like testing way, but in a curious, like challenging kind of way. So it's, it's a bit of a tricky balance there um, and something that I think um, you, you can both learn with experience and also comes a little bit in terms of your, your, you bring your personality, your actual personality to the interview. Yeah. You know, it's it's um, it's interesting because we we started the show 13 years ago. We made a decision that our show was going to be apolitical. Now, even though we both made that decision, I don't think that we agree or really uh, understand what that word even means, right? Um, I don't know um, why airing a, sh a story about the occupation is more or less political than airing a story about a trans Orthodox rabbi or about reform or conservative prayer at the Western Wall or about the prices of peppers or anything else. Um, but the way that we came to understand our apolitical mandate was that we tried to um, the best of our ability uh, not to engage with uh, the core topic of the occupation. It's not to say that we didn't have a lot of stories of Palestinians. We did um, over the years, but they tended to be sort of human interest stories and lighter stories and so on and so forth. And that um, strategy served us really, really well. And as a result, our listenership, and we're a very data-oriented um, uh, organization, so we know a lot about our listenership, and our listenership um, is really varied. We have, um, it's varied politically, it's va varied religiously, it's varied in terms of denominations, and we um, ask in every single annual listener survey whether um, people uh, think that Israel Story is an honest broker, and consistently, 91, 92, 93 percent of the respondents say yes, and those who say no are usually split between those who say that we're left-leaning and those who say that we're right-leaning, so we thought that we were doing a good job. However, I'll say that the events of 2023 in Israel, um, first with the judicial reform 
and now with the war, uh, were so dramatic that it seemed to us that um, staying out of current affairs was a greater political statement than engaging with them. So that um, uh, whole project that we did with the Declaration of Independence, which, mind you, were 13 episodes out of 37 into that uh, project. It's all, it's all on hold um, because of the war. Um, and, and everything that we're doing on Wartime Diaries now is very, very different in its nature. I don't think Bibi was mentioned once on Israel's story prior to 2023. And now I don't think there's a single episode in which Bibi isn't mentioned. Um, so it's, and, and it's complicated. We have our own biases. I don't know if you remember, but that father whose son is a hostage who said that, you know, he, he, he wants to, he thinks that winning the war is more important than reaching a deal. You know, we sort of, at, we ask, really? And what does your wife think about this? And, uh, and I don't know that we would ask someone on the left those kind of questions. I don't think we would, to be honest. I think that would fly and we wouldn't even notice it. So we also have our own biases and we try to be careful about them, but uh, we're, we're also who we are, you know? So being open-hearted and open-minded and honest, thank you for bringing that all to us tonight. You're all invited to stay for more conversation, for more food and more community. Thanks for being here. Thank you, everyone.